Marcus Consultant here in Stockholm. I do some blogging. Uh, I'm a trainer, mostly a powerful trainer. And I mean like I didn't an automation. Today I want to talk talk to you a little bit about my journey with PowerShell, how I started learning PowerShell and my experiences, how I started to question whether I was a developer or not, and started to interest myself in version control and how I started trying to understand version control and start trying to use it. And I want to demonstrate using Git and really quickly cover what GitHub is. So first, like three years ago, three and a half years ago, I started interesting myself for PowerShell. And I started writing like small scripts, mostly for uh, automating small tedious tasks in my environment, uh, like <coughs> reading a log file or doing something simple. And every time I did it, I had to do less of the tedious stuff and more of the PowerShell stuff. So that was, yeah, life was good. And after a while, my scripts grew and my colleagues saw my scripts and saw me spending less time with boring tasks and more time with <laughs> PowerShell. Um, so some of my colleagues started asking me for scripts for their jobs or like for s some stuff that they wanted automated. So I started helping them and I started sharing my scripts and after a while I learned more and more about PowerShell. So I went back to my old scripts and opened up a script that you wrote when you just started, and opening up six months later uh, can be a painful experience. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I ended up like rewriting -write my own scripts. Started to create a new version of uh, of my own scripts, and each version or each script got multiple versions, and each version got working copies. Like I have version four point six of this script, and I want to create version four point seven. So I have like some intermediate working version, and um, yeah. Quite soon, my whole scripting library looked something like this. Then someone came to me and asked, you know that script you gave me like six months ago, four months ago, whatever? Now, it works kind of good in the way I wanted to, or the way I used to use it. But now I want to do this other thing with it also. Can you please modify it? And then I had to write. So I got the script he obviously got from me. And then I had to try to read the script I wrote. And maybe I didn't make it really readable. So I had to go through the pain and understand what I did as a new PowerShell. And then I had to compare it to all my versions and try to figure out which of my changes would work with his version and so on. So. Um, and I started to collaborate with other scripters. I, I, um, I found other people also doing PowerShell and VBScript for that matter. And we started to share in code and we emailed code back and forth. I zipped down the directory like that and I emailed it to some friend and they unzipped it, did some changes, zipped it up and mailed it back to me again. And after a while we, we ended up both changing the same zip file and emailing it to each other. And yeah. It got huge. So, and to keep track of everything, we created a huge block comment in the start of each file with a change log saying, I changed this on this date for this reason, and um, trying to keep track of changes within a comment block. So, after a while, a few scripts, especially the VBScript, could be like 2,000 rows of VBScript and 500 rows of comment. I just, yeah. So, Suddenly I did less and less of the fun PowerShell stuff and more and more of the compare, merge, compare, merge, compare, merge. <laughs> and um, different text comparison tools was the most, m m most of my time I spent in them. So my work part was when my work, work life got chaotic. And I started to think, what should I do and how could I solve this problem? Because I didn't think of myself as a developer. I'm just writing some simple scripts. I'm not programming. I'm just using like script languages, not real programming. And I don't have the time or money to invest in buying and learning about developer processes and developer tools 
uh, I wouldn't have either time or money to buy like Team Foundation server and try to figure out how to install it and set up all the seven, six, eight, I don't know, service that was required and try to learn the process and so on. Um, yeah, I, I just didn't think I could do any of that. Then, one day not too long ago, someone told me that if your code runs in production environments, then you're a developer. And if you're a developer, you need to take responsibility for that code like a developer does. So I'm not saying that I'm a developer, I'm not a developer, actually I don't really care. But the thing about this sentence that someone told me is that especially if someone else runs my code in their production environment, then I gotta take a certain responsibility for that code. So that's when I started to look into how developers worked, uh, how, what other partial enthusiasts did and how they managed their code. And I started to try to figure out what this Git everyone was talking about really was. So when I started researching this, I found three phrases or three words. I found version control, revision control, and source control. And I did, really didn't understand what the difference was. And to be honest, I don't think I still do. But I think version control is like the, the broader scope. Uh, revision control is something usually used for binaries and, and not text stuff. And source control is more about version controlling source code. Um, and uh, usually involves processes around how to work with the source code. But I, I'm using version control in, in this presentation because, well, we are controlling versions, so I assume that's, that's a great one. So what is version control? And I quite soon learned that what I needed to do to take responsibility for my code is to know who changed something, what they changed, and when they changed it. And hopefully, they also added a good comment telling me why they changed it. Because that's not something I, the system will tell me. So, who changed something, what changed, and when it changed, that is something that the version control system will tell me. Why they did it is something they hopefully will write in a comment. And why should I care about these things? Well, if I had code running in production and suddenly it stops working, everyone is going to say, well, I didn't do anything. Because that's usually what happens. And I'm not looking to, for someone to blame, but to fix the problem, like every time you introduce a change to something, there's a risk, risk for it breaking. And if you know what changed, it's easier to fix it back. So first of all, version control gives you the ability to revert or review a previous state of a file or of code. So you can go back and see this part, how did it look yesterday, last week, last year, and so on. And it also gives you the possibility to maintain different versions. You can, for instance, tag a certain version and say this is version 1. And then you can keep taking snapshots in time. And after a while, once you're ready, you can tag another snapshot and say, this snapshot in time is version two, and so forth. And it gives you a great way to collaborate with others, to share code and work on the same code. And if you're gonna look at something called like continuous integration, continuous deployment, or continuous delivery, like Steven uh, talked about Monday morning, version control is something that is absolutely core. So all the modern type of agile uh, work processes really require version control. Now what you is can, it? You can also recover from something that you've done before, right? Yeah, sure. Something that you accidentally overwrote. If you accidentally you overwrote something, you can, you can go back and copy that part from, yeah. from the history. You can go back to, to a part in time or a uh, sometimes well, a, a certain point in time and take 
a copy of something and you can bring just that copy into your current current copy. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So version control as I see it is basically usually you have a file system and what I have had before was a file system with a bunch of files. And what version control does is it adds something to that file system which is metadata. And I'm visualizing that with a database symbol here. So Git, which I'm gonna talk about later on, actually adds metadata about your files in a hidden system folder within your folder structure. So when you convert a folder to a repository, you create a new hidden folder called .git. And that contains all the metadata, all the changes, all the history, everything of your repository. And querying that metadata, you can go back and forth in time. And there's two ways you can do version control. There is something I refer to as an older way because I think it was indented before. Uh, that is called centralized version control, which is usually used in larger companies. And that's one central repository. And to change something, you have to check out the file. And then you lock that file. You get a copy of it. You can edit and modify the file. And once you're done with your changes, you can check in that file again. And since it's locked, no one else will be able to modify that file until you check it back in again. And then you have something called distributed version control systems, which Git is. And distributed systems means that everyone has a full copy of the full repository. Like everyone has the full change log, everyone has the full, all the comments, the full history, everything. So what you should do is that you create one central repository and everyone that wants to be a part of your pro pro uh, project downloads a full copy of your repository. And to download something from the central repository to your local is called to clone it. It's basically Git language for download. So, and everyone works on their copy, and once they're ready for it, they can synchronize only their changes. And when they syn synchronize their changes up again through the central or to the upstream, it uh, only sends your changes up. And what it actually does is it takes all the changes that you don't have in your local, it downloads them and merges them into your changes and then sends them all up again. So the process of working with Git is first you create a repository, for instance in GitHub, or in any other system that it has a server, and then you download the, the whole repository, which in Git is called clone. So you clone the repository and you get a full local copy. And then you work on that local copy as much as you want. You create a you do a change, and once you have once you're satisfied that you want this change kept track of, track of, you add it to something called staging. And doing an add is basically telling Git that this change is something I want to keep track on. So make sure that it gets into the data database. And once you added all the changes you want to have in your database, you do a commit. And doing commit is basically like uh, pressing a snapshot on your virtual machine. It saves the current state of, of everything you have added to your, um, to your repository. And with that commit, you should write a message explaining why you did something. And once you've done that, you can start changing files again, and you can add them to staging, and then you can commit them, and change, add, commit, and so on. And then, when you're ready for it, you can take your changes and push them up back to the central repository. Although, you should, while working on your process, project, also take some responsibility and uh, download all the changes made in the central repository, so you keep your local repository up to date with whatever everyone else is doing. So that it should probably be like a small circle in the middle here where you, where you keep in sync, but we're gonna look at that later on. So for starters, I have a new clean hard drive just to make it simple. 
and uh, I want to create a git repository. Actually, we, maybe we should. Hmm. Um, I'm going to create a new repository on my local machine, and I'm going to work on it just locally, because git is to run git, you only need a git client. <coughs> and um, to uh, to run git with well, I really hmm. should be a few more slides in between, but I put them somewhere. Hang on a second, I might have. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Should put them in Git. <laughs> um, anyway, to work with uh, with Git, you, the only thing you need is a client, and um, that client could be a Git, the Git uh, command line client, which I use, uh, or it could be a bunch of different GUI tools. There are GUI tools like Source Tree from Atlassian. Uh, GitHub has a client they used to call the GitHub from Windows. But I think they released a new one last week called GitHub for Desktop. And that's the same one for Windows and uh, Mac OS and maybe Linux also. So I get a bit more of a common experience on all platforms. And uh, you can use Git integration in Visual Studio. Visual Studio Code has Git integration. So there is a lot of programs with support for Git that you can use. But I'm only using a console. And when I install the client, I install the, the regular Git, and all the, or at least most of the GUI tools, they actually use the command line Git in the background. So when you do stuff in the GUI, it's going to call the Git command line in the background. Have you found any uh, ISE integration? Mm, I don't think there is any, but it might be. It's going to be. Awesome. Satellite. I see steroids. Next week. Perfect. Um, so I first download and install the Git client. It's just a regular installer. And then I have two things that I use uh, as a help or assistance. The first thing is the Posh Git module, uh, and that's published to the PowerShell gallery. So if I have internet, which I hope. The resolution is a bit messy, but you can see Posh Git uh, is on the PowerShell gallery. So you can download it from there. Once downloaded, you might need to add um, and loading it to your profile so you always have it, have it ready because it will rewrite your uh, prompt function and give you some stuff, I'll show it later. And then there also, there's also um, something called git credential win store, uh, which sadly isn't done in any packet management. But if we do the search for git credential win store, You gotta hit on Codeplex, and this hasn't been updated for quite some while. Uh, it's lately updated, the latest updated in May 2013. But there is two ways of handling credentials in Git. One way is using SSH, and to use SSH, you need SSH keys and some SSH agent keeping tra track of them and so on. And I'm not used to Linux, so I think the whole SSH part is a bit complex. So I use the git credential win store, which means every time I use the git command and I try to connect to a repository where I have to supply a username and password, if I use the HTTPS protocol to, uh, to uh, talk to the repository, I get a um, credential pop-up and I enter my credentials and it's gonna save them in the Windows credential vault for me. So then I never have to type them again. And that's nice. So. That's the client, and we're going to start just working with the client. I create a new <coughs> a 
new directory called my project. And you can see one while I do the same project is created here. So this is just a folder that can put whatever I want in it. And if I want this to become a git repository, I type git in it. And this is where it's not really PowerShell anymore because git is an exe file and an application. And all the commands I use with git is Linux-like syntax or, yeah. Okay, one question, if I understand it right, um, then you have to be in the local folder where you want to do things. For example, now you have to, you have to really be in my project to apply that to git. What is your best practice to make sure that you have a git command available? So the question was, I have to be in my local local path to make it, because if I call git, it will make the path I currently am in uh, to repository. And the best practice, or my best practice to make the git command available is to add it to the path environment variable. So I have it available everywhere. So if I type git in it and push enter, it's going to tell me it has initialized a new repository. And what you see in the file explorer here on the, uh, on the right is that I have a new hidden folder, and it's called .git. And if I enter that one, I have a lot of files and objects and whatnot. And this is all the, the metadata for my repository. And it's currently empty because I haven't added anything, but it's, it's prepared. Question. One more question. Where does this master come from? Yeah. Uh, the master, when, uh, when I have the push git module installed, it will show me uh, git status in, uh, in the prompt. And it detects if I currently am within the repository. So if I, in PowerShell, cd back to my root, you see that my prompt goes back to normal. And as soon as I cd into my project again, push git detects that I'm now in a git repository, and it tells me you're in the master branch. The first branch created in a repository is always called master. It doesn't have to be default. You can change the default uh, later on. But the first one that is created is always master. Sorry to ask again, could you show the prompt function real quick? Dollar function prompt? Like this now? No, just dollar function colon prompt. Yeah. Okay. Yep, so we're in the branch master and I'm in an empty repository. So I can go on and create a file, and I'm going to do it with Notepad just because it's quick. File1.txt, and yes, create it, call it, this is my first file. And I'll save that file in close Notepad. If I now do something here, the master part of the prompt is not updated until the prompt function is called again, obviously. So if I do it there, uh, my prompt is updated. And it might be hard to see, but it's red text over here. And it means that I'm in master. And the red text means that I have one file that is added to my working di uh, directory, which is not added to the repository. It's red because it's not added to my staging area. I have zero files, tilde zero, that is modified. I have <coughs> minus zero, which is zero deleted files in my working area. So if I want more details about this, I can go and type git status. And it tells, it tells me that I'm on branch master. Let's scroll a bit so you can see. I'm on branch master. I am, the commit I am at is at initial commit. So there are no commits done. And I have one untracked file. So if I want to track this file, I want to add it to something called a staging area. And that's not another place in the file system. It's just to tell Git that we should keep track of this. I type git add, and then the file I want to add. And if I have 
the push uh, git module installed, I will get autocomplete on my files. So when I tab here, I will only get the files that are available for add. So if I had the 100 files, it will only autocomplete for file one, not file the other files. Now my project turns green, or the prompt here turns green. It means that I have one file in staging area, zero files in change, and zero files deleted. And I can go ahead and create another one. File2.txt, yes, file2, save, close, ls. Let's create a screen first and then ls. So this tells us now that we have one in staging area and one in working directory. I can do as much change that I want in the working directory. It does not affect my repository at all. It's first when I add something or add a change. And if I do a lot of stuff, so let's open up Notepad again. If I have a lot of rows like this, and I save it and close it and then add the file, Uh, there is a GUI within the command line client that I can use to see the changes I've done and what's currently in in uh, staging area and working area. And that's called git GUI. So if I type git GUI, I get a GUI tool. And it's a very simple tool. It has four parts. The first part is the red part here, which is unstaged changes. Here's state changes, and here's the text field and a message box. So if I click this file one, it will show me the details of that file. And it says a green line here, meaning this line was added to my file. And it tells me now that I don't have a new, new line at the end of the file, so it's just one file. And I can also look at file two and see the changes here. I'll close that one and go get back to it later. Now if I want to take a snapshot of my current staging area, I do git commit dash m for message and a string. And this string is the commit message. This is what I will see in my log later on. So <coughs> this should answer the question, why did I change something? So let's say Project requires documentation. Question? I don't know. If I, was just, I just want to add it's really powerful if you work with GitHub because if you have issues, you can close. If you have an open issue that has a number, you can just put close and the issue number in the commit message and it's going to be closed in Git. Exactly. If I'm Maybe working. I'm going to cover that, but it's, it's really yep. a good feature. Yeah. If I'm working with GitHub and I have an issue, uh, every issue is created with a ID number. And if I type the keyword closing or I think fixes and hashtag or pound and a number, GitHub would automatically read that in my message and link my commit to that issue and close the issue for me. So if I'm working on GitHub, I should use did this change just closing pound four and that will close issue number four. You can also reference usernames. I can also reference, oh, yeah. I didn't know that. I can reference using uh, the issue name. Cool. What do you mean by issue? Uh, I'll show you that later. <laughs> so now I can do git log. It will show me a text log of all my changes or all my commits. And now we can see that I have one commit that has a long ID number. The author was me or who changed it and when it was changed, and then I can see the message. Why did it change? And this will add to it for every commit I do. So if I create some, if I edit something again, let's first create a new file, file three. And I'm just gonna write something in it, save it and close. And then I clear my screen and do a list director again. We'll see that I now have one added file. And then I want to modify my file too. 
So I'm opening that, that in Notepad and I remove that G in the middle of the code. I save it and I close Notepad again. Clear my screen and list the folder contents again. We now see that we have one added file and one modified file. And now I can add the files. Git status will give me the status, so it tells me that file one was modified and file three was uh, added. So if I do git add, and now I can autocomplete between, let's scroll up, autocomplete with only the files that are modified and not all the files in my directory. So the push git module knows that when I'm typing git add, I'm only interested in autocompleting files that was modified that can be added. Can you wildcard that? Can you say add all? Yes. Yeah. I can uh, do dash dash all, which will just add all everything. A dot works as well. Yeah. Uh, just a caution if you do a dot all, if you have sensitive files or log files or, or pictures and images and that sort of thing you don't want to check in, you should explore there's something called git ignore. Maybe you're going to come back well. Uh, I wasn't it, going to have it. It's really useful if you're doing it in production and, and you have log files and stuff you don't want to put into source control. So have a look at git ignore. And git ignore is basically, <coughs> you can tell your git repository that files or folders matching a certain pattern or a certain string will uh, be ignored by git, so it won't be added. Oh yeah, like those people who accidentally committed their Amazon Web Services yeah. API. Exactly. If you save your API <laughs> keys <laughs> to your repository, you should really have them in a file ignored by git so that they don't end up in GitHub. So, I could add the files with git add, but I'm going to show you the git GUI again. So, I type git GUI and I get the GUI. This time we can see that both my files are in the red staging area. And this time, if I look at file 2, <coughs> remember that I only remove the G in here. Let's see if I can try to zoom. Whoa. <laughs> okay, scrolling with a touchpad is hard. Whoops. Oh, that'll do. So, I only removed the G, but what Git tells me is that I removed this whole line. It says minus R, yeah, in all red text. And then it tells me that I added this line. So Git works with lines and tells me I removed one line and added another one. So if I want to If I want to stage this, I can right click on it and I can choose either stage hunk for commit or stage line for commit. And this way in the GUI I can stage only certain parts of my file. If I change like four different parts of my file, I can stage one of the changes <coughs> or one line of my changes to my commit and let, the, let Git ignore the rest of them. Now I only did one change, but I'm going to stage this change. And you'll see that my file uh, is now represented in the stage changes. So what's the scenario where you want to do that? Usually if you have a, a large script and you do multiple changes and you realize that this thing is something I want to commit and the other one is something I want to keep working on, then you can commit this and keep the other one uncommitted. What was that hunk? Uh, like the a bunch of rows together. So if I shunk. <laughs> Sorry? So shunk. Shunk, hunk, yeah. yeah. I didn't write the, the, the tool, so I don't know what I do. But yeah, shunk maybe. Uh, and um, and this file, file 3, is uh, not added at all. So I'm going to right click in here and say. It is going to be a stage, stage. Do you have a stage somewhere? Can you undo that? Yes, I can click on the files here, no, and if I in the stage area. Like yeah, so now I click on the file two in the stage area. Yeah. This the change I just staged, and I can go back and click this and unstage, so I can bring it back to the staging uh, to the on-stage area. 
So I can, for each line in my file or for the whole file, I can take it back and forth between the, my working copy and the staging area. And remove it from the unstaged, so it takes away the change completely? Uh, yeah, then I had to... Uh, then I check it out from my last commit. So if I... I actually don't know how to do that in the GUI, but if I do git check out, I think I typed a file, so file 2. Yeah. So now I checked out my file from my last saved snapshot. And if we open the file, you see that the G is, is back in here again. Um, you can't say you have to try Oops. So now the G is in my file again. Uh, but the problem with this, when I check out something, I, uh, I lost all my changes because it overwrote my, my file. There's a little problem with the terminology there, because check out uh, is usually the so yeah. it can get really confusing with other source controls. It can be really confusing if you're used to centralized source control, because check out means that you download a file and lock it. Check out and git does not download a file and block it, it just <laughs> brings something from another. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if I want to keep all my changes and move back and forth in my tree, there is something called stash, so I can do git stash, and that will just save all my temporary changes in a stash, and then I can move about and do checkouts and stuff. And then I can revert my stash so I can bring it back to my stash. Like having a coffin and just put all the or like chest on my floor and then just put all the stuff I'm working on in the in the box and then I get a clean desk and can do something and once I'm done with doing whatever I went back to do, I can just pick them up from the chest again. Uh we're gonna yeah, we're gonna look at it quickly, but um Yeah. So let's uh, let's do that change again. I remove the G from this file, close it, clear my screen, list my directory, and we can see that I have updated changes. So I'll git add dash dash all. It all turned green, and then I can commit it. Added more documentation <coughs> fixes like number four. So if I had a, a issue or uh, something in GitHub that had a number four, this will close that one. But we'll look at it more in detail later. Um, I'm back at my master. Now there is another GUI, GUI tool called GitK. And if I run that one, I get a visual or graphical. Oops, that's not good. Uh, let's see, here we go. This gives me a graphical representation of the history of my repository. So here we can see the branches, and I can branch uh, a repository, meaning I create um, another branch, like a tree. So this is going to show me branches back and forth, and I can click on them and see. Here is my original um, change, and here is my last one, and I can see what changed in, in each commit and so on. So we can see that in this change, I added file one, and I added all these changes to file two. And if I click on the next one, zoom in here, we can see the history that I removed the G from here. So, and here you can, you can basically just copy paste text and put it back in your, in your uh, working area again if you want to. So you don't need to check out the file, you can just look in the log and see what changed. There is also a git log, and with git log there is a, a lot and lot and lot of commands that give you uh, details. They can say, give me all, only changes on this row by this user in this part of time and so on. So there's a lot of parameters to that one. All right, so let's quickly 
go to GitHub and see how that works. So I just go to github.com. Oops, here. When I log into GitHub, I get it's not only sort of control, it's also community. So I get like my GitHub feed here, news feed, what, what happened in my repositories or repositories I contribute to. I uh, see all the repositories I currently contribute to. Up in the right, I see all my repositories down on the right, and I can choose to click the green button new repository. So if I click a new one, I can add it and call, let's call it my demo. I can choose if it should be public or private and type a description. This is just some demo repository. And if I want to, I can choose to initialize this repository with README. This will create a new file in the repository called readme.md. And it's a text file in Markdown language or whatever you call it, uh, which will make a nicely formatted readme for your repository when other people go into your repository and want to read about your project. You can also here add a git ignore uh, and ignore stuff. It's, diff uh, it's a lot of ignore profiles that you can choose from which will ignore uh, different files and you can add a license and this is important because if you don't have a license some people might not be able to contribute to to your repository but if you have a license explicitly stating that they they are allowed to copy your code and so on then they uh, can contribute I usually choose the MIT license because it's short and fairly simple but if you want to read more about them, GitHub has a great uh, licensing guide. So just search for Git licensing and you'll find it. Microsoft is always using MIT, right? Or I think Microsoft is using MIT, but I don't know if anyone here knows. <laughs> we can check later. I think that at least Microsoft employees can uh, contribute to, to repositories without the license. But I'm not sure. You'll have to ask them. So this created my repository. I got my license file and I got my readme.md and the readme file will be shown here as a document. And since it's markdown, I can get it nicely formatted. Now I want to download this repository to my computer. And that's why this... Here, there's a URI in the in the bottom right of the page and you can choose between HTTPS and SSH and there's, there's different protocols since I'm using the credential WinStore I use the HTTPS URLs so I click in this box here and I copy go back to my e colon and now again I have to stand where I want to create a repository so I'm an e colon and I type git clone. Clone is git for download. And then I just paste my URL. Push, press enter and git will download everything for me. And you can see that I now got the my demo folder and the files I just created in GitHub. And now I can work on this locally. Let's create a new Oh, my demo. Ah, wrong word, sorry, thank you. My demo. Notepad file one txt. Create it. Add some code. Close it. Clear my screen. You can see I have something added. I can add my file. Git commit dash m for a message and say added required documentation. Now, this is something different than we did last time because now master turns to green. And this means that my local repository is ahead of the remote repository. So there is a difference between GitHub and my local repository. So I can work as much as I like on my local repository but if I switch back to GitHub and refresh my page, you'll see that nothing here has changed. Mm -hmm. 
So now it's only been a few minutes since I last downloaded the repository and I don't think someone put something in it because I'm the only one with access. But if it would have been longer time, I want to to um, to download and synchronize the changes. So the first thing I do is to git pull and that will just download all my all the changes from the remote repository down into my and once I'm done with that I can do git push well, that will merge it's changes sorry <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah exactly uh, pull is first it will fetch everything and then it will it will merge everything into my uh, current repository uh, and then I can push it and then I will push it or, or upload all my changes what, what, would happen if, what would happen if there were uh, merge conflicts? Then it will tell you that it, there are merge conflicts and you have to resolve them before you can pull. Okay. The only problem with this workflow is that if someone had done changes here, those changes would have been added after my changes and I would like inject my changes before them and then I will push the new one up to the repository. So it might be a bit messy and that's why there is a parameter called a rebase on pull. So if I want, I can do git pull dash dash rebase. And that fetches all the changes and then it stores my changes away and, and merge the central changes or the, the remote changes. And then it replays my changes after the um, the ones I downloaded. So in that way, if someone changed some, something while I was working, I will get their changes before mine. And that's just easier because they don't get confused when, when their log is changed. So that's why you should use rebase. Um, the, the, the logging on who changed what, that comes in uh, when you Going Oops. Area, right? uh, when I commit something, it is added to the log. Yeah. So yes. the log doesn't. Uh, when it's on a stage, it's, anyone can do anything and just it detects what's changed, but not by doing. Yeah. Yeah. So I can basically, if I'm in my demo here, clear my screen. So no no I one can, can upload changes to staging area if the, they don't have permission. Well, my repository locally. It's my repository. I can do whatever I want with it. Yeah. But I cannot push up my changes to a remote repository if I don't have access to that repository. Yeah. So if I want to, I can go into File Explorer here and I can just delete all my files. And do it there. And we'll see that my repository is empty. And then I can type git checkout master and it will check out. Should have been. Um, yeah, I can just remove all the, the changes. Uh, and I'll just quickly go through the... Um, when I work with repositories on GitHub that isn't mine, I have to fork them. So what I How do... How do you get those things back uh, I do uh, git... Um, I think I can revert. Git revert. Uh, yeah, I can I can revert from the so here is the, the changes that is uh, going to be uh, moved back, and I can see them. So what's the difference between revert and checkout then? Checkout would only move between your uh, your branches, but. Uh, I think it, I don't know what it does with the with the uh, with the working area. I wonder what happens here. Nothing happens. Okay. <laughs> Not sure what I did. I quit no, that too. Yay. Yeah, I'm not the Vim. 
Control and Q. Oh. Ah, perfect. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, search for it is a, a lot of documentation. So, but you use git revert and you can revert a file from. Uh, from but that's not the central purpose, though, right? No, this is just only on my computer. Uh, so I can uh, I can basically just delete my whole um, my whole whole demo. Oh, it's open here. So if I delete this .git, I delete my repository. So I can delete my folder, which is open somewhere. If I were to, oh here it is. If you remove the uh, the master directory, how do you get the master directory back if it's checked in to the stage there? Uh, once you do changes on GitHub, you have to. Uh, is this like set local on your? Yeah, this is just local on my computer, and once I do uh, push, I upload the changes. So your central repository is GitHub, or is it another server like on-premise? Uh, it can be another server on-premise, it can be your friend's computer, it can be basically a share somewhere, it can be GitHub, it can be Team Foundation server, it can be Team Foundation server online, it can be GitLab, yeah. basically whatever you want that supports Git. Do you have a recommendation for some on-premise? Is GitLab is great yeah. for on-premise. It's also on-premise? Yeah, it's open source and you can install it from prem Tim? It's probably also what we're saying. You can also manage to get to HTTP requests. So you can use yeah. both requests with REST <coughs> requests. Um, what it means is you could use something funky like ice and steroids and take the outputs from errors that have been recorded and then actually create issues mm -hmm. and yeah. commit so that you can uh, yeah, completely manage and in an automated way that you want to use it for. Great. So I'm going to push the button. <laughs>